as a scientist, I can tell you, we've promised a lot. We've, we've spent a tremendous amount of money looking for new treatments for a whole variety of medical diseases. And the truth is, we just don't have a lot to show for it. Now, this has been troubling scientists, and one of the things that's most concerning is that many of the drugs, in fact, most of the drugs that work really well when we test them on animals, they don't work on humans. Some scientists think, well, you know, maybe we're studying the wrong animals. We should be studying monkeys, more monkeys, because, well, most of us study rats and mice, and humans are more like monkeys than we are like rats and mice. Okay. I think we're systematically ignoring the elephant in the room. These animals, the animals we use in our labs, they live under very tight conditions in their cages. Humans, we have freedom. We don't live in cages. And freedom makes us different. But before I tell you why I think cages are the problem, I'm going to tell you about my moral bias. You see, scientists also have biases, and we should be open about them. So some people, on one extreme, believe that animals should never be eaten, they should never be experimented on, and in no way should we use them or kill them for human purposes. On the other end of the spectrum, you have people that believe that animals don't matter that behind their eyes, they're just disposable bags of tissue. I sit somewhere in the middle. I think that if we experiment on animals, we have a moral obligation not to waste them. But more than that, I think we can do better science if we recognize their psychological experiences. Now, don't get me wrong. I think animal experiments have done a world of good for human health. Take diabetes. Diabetes is a dreadful disease, and it used to strike down children. But about a century ago, scientists did lots of experiments on pigs and dogs, and as a result of those experiments, they discovered insulin. So today, there's millions of diabetics all across the world that use insulin to manage their diabetes, and they live long and healthy lives. Polio is another example. It used to be widespread. If it didn't kill you, it left you paralyzed for life. So scientists, they took extracts from a boy, the spine of a boy, the spinal cord of a boy, and they injected those extracts after the boy died of polio, and they injected those extracts into monkeys. They killed a lot of monkeys. But they discovered a vaccine as a result of that. And today, because of that vaccine, polio has been almost entirely eradicated from the human population. Good stuff, right? But biomedical research with the use of animals has also been a tragic waste of time and money. I'll give you a couple of examples of that. So Alzheimer's is one of those examples. So in the last three decades, Scientists have identified over 300 different interventions that work really well for treating animals that have some of the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease, and not a single one of them works for humans. And this is the decade of neuroscience, if not the last 50 years of neuroscience research, all being highly you know, glorified in a sense. But with, with all the research that we've done, and a lot of it is with animals, we have yet to come up with a new generation of drugs to treat any psychiatric illness. And when I think about this, I'm not just thinking about the waste of animals here. This is also a waste of the young scientists who put in a lot of effort into, into their work. And it's, it's not only that, it's the, it's the waste of the hopes of so many millions of people that think that a cure is, is on its way. So, what's really troubling me is this. We've known for over 60 years 
that the cages we put our animals into are affecting their biology. So get this. Back in the late 50s, a prominent scientist compared the problem-solving abilities of a rat in a cage versus a rat, a pet rat. And the pet rat was way better at solving problems than the rat in a cage. This is a cage for a rat. So since then, there have been other experiments that have been done. And these experiments involved comparisons of how animals fare if they're in a standard cage versus an enriched cage. And you can see that the enriched cage has a lot of objects in it. It's a more complex environment. And what they find, first of all, is that if you put a mouse in a more complex environment like that, the architecture of its brain is also more complex. OK, so what I've just told you is that you put an animal in a complex environment and it gets smarter. But these animals aren't just smarter. They're also more resilient to just about everything we do to them. So I mentioned Alzheimer's before, I'll mention it again. So the way you make a mouse um, seem like a person with Alzheimer's is you can, make it, you can genetically engineer this animal to have some of the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. We've been studying them for decades in different forms of these genetically engineered mice, but if you put them in an enriched cage, Alzheimer's symptoms mostly disappear. Okay? So it's not just Alzheimer's, though. So drugs of abuse. We've been studying drugs of abuse for years, trying to understand why people take drugs like narcotics and stimulants, even alcohol. Well, here's the thing. You can get an animal to take drugs. Yes, you can get an animal to take drugs if you put them in a small cage alone. But you put them in a rich cage with something to do, anything to do, and they're just not all that interested in drugs. And so far, I've been talking about things of the head, the brain, right? But it doesn't just apply to that. It also applies to things like cancer. You put an animal in an enriched cage, and they're more resilient to cancer. All right. So I'm thinking about this. I've been in science for a while. So this was probably a few years ago. And it occurs to me that we're looking at this thing backwards. It's not that the enriched cages are making our animals stronger. It's that those standard cages are making the animals weaker. And I got this idea by thinking about how animals live in the wild. So there's a mouse. You're looking at a mouse out in the wild, and you're looking at some mice in a cage. And you can compare, now you can compare the area that it traverses in the wild versus what it gets in a cage. And, and you can see that in this, in this, um, this schematic that I have, and you can't really see the cage, right? But you can see where the, 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 you can see that that's a fairly big home range. And in fact, it's hundreds of thousands of fold bigger than what it gets in a cage. So just so you can see something there, that's 100 cages all arranged side by side. <laughs> the irony is monkeys actually have it a lot worse. The home range that a monkey roams is millions of fold bigger, more expansive than it, what it gets in a cage. We live in three dimensions. That's a cage, a photo of a cage for two monkeys. There's the upper level and lower level for two different monkeys superimposed on a forest in which they naturally would live. Here's the thing. Monkeys climb, right? So these are capuchin monkeys. And what you're seeing is their bodies at work climbing, and you're seeing their brains at work. They're figuring out how to get stuff. I don't know what he's getting, but he's after a, there's, there's some opening of a clam. And, and, and one of the things I want to say here is that they've also figured out how to use tools. And this little capuchin monkey here is, has figured out how to use a rock to smash open a cashew nut. OK? This is what normal monkeys do. This is a primate facility. Short of escape, the animals that are in this facility can never, ever have a new experience. They can jump around from side to side. They can turn around in circles. And here's a little capuchin monkey. You know, 
We can give her a toy. We can say, oh, we're giving this, mount, this monkey enrichment. But this animal is never going to have the chance to try to figure out how to use a rock to break open a cashew nut. So I'm going to pause for a second and not show you something on the screen to tell you this. The way in which we practice science goes like this. We take one group of animals, and we call those animals the disease, like that's our experimental group. They're the animals that have some kind of disease. And we compare those animals to our control group, the ones that, that we would assume are normal and healthy. But look at these rats. Do they look healthy to you? They can't stand up straight. They can't really move all that much. You know, I'd be more active just watching TV all day with a beer in my hand. But you know, these animals, they're depressed, they're frustrated, they're bored. They can't make choices and they're out of shape. Scientists shrewdly thought, well, why don't we just put these animals out in the wild? In a, well, it's not quite the wild. It's called a naturalistic enclosure. So what you do is you put these animals in an area that's a lot like what they would naturally get, except they, they can't really get out. And what you see here are laboratory rats using their bodies, learning about things that they didn't anticipate, like, I've got to get out of the rain because it's raining. I've got to, or in learning how to find different kinds of food and, and, and uh, explore those kinds of things. What you're seeing is normal and healthy for a rat. And in that experiment that was done, oh, 15 years ago, there is actually a really nice solution. So imagine a world in which we had research barns where our animals, instead of being in those tiny little cages, they could have indoor and outdoor areas and they'd have, have to deal with all kinds of unanticipated challenges and opportunities, like a real barn, except they couldn't escape. In those, there are some good companies that make good cages and they could mass produce some really good barns, I'm sure. Now, this, could, this, this kind of model could work really wonderfully because we're now in the 20th century. We all have cell phones, right? So we can use the wireless technologies that are in our cell phones, you know, the Bluetooth and the Wi-Fi. We, we can use tools like that to monitor the physiology and study the physiologies of these animals as they're being themselves. It's just time. This is the best we can do for primates. All I want to say is this is really good pasture for cows. <laughs> we can do a lot better. And you can imagine what that could look like. What's holding us back? What's holding scientists back from doing this? Because it seems pretty obvious, doesn't it? Well, there are those scientists that say, you know, we've got to control the variables. We've got to put these animals in tiny little cages because that way we control the variables. But that's a myth. We don't control the variables. We actually don't control them. We don't control the sounds that they listen to. We don't control the chemistry of their food. We don't control how they're handled. We don't control how they're shipped from institution to institution. Var variables are not under control. And I can get into that, but I won't. Some scientists say, and I think this is a bigger concern, is that it just costs a lot of money. It's going to cost us more to house animals in bigger containers where they could actually be themselves than it would be if we house them in those little tiny shoe boxes. But here we could take a page from physicists. You know, they built those massive, massive pieces of equipment, 17-acre hadron colliders, to look at molecules and subatomic particles, you know, neutrons and quarks. I mean, it seems to me like biologists should be able to argue for research barns to study mice and rats. I mean, a mouse is more complex than a quark. 
So there's that, and then maybe they will still cost, it still will cost much because we just can't argue as well as physicists. <laughs> eh. But you know, maybe we'd have to share. So, so right now, we, we use like, in research, 76,000 primates in the United States to study all our various diseases, and untold millions of rodents. You know, it wouldn't hurt us to share. Maybe we could get out of our academic silos and actually talk to one another and we might learn something from that. So why am I telling you? I'm telling you for two reasons. One, I want you to be skeptical. I want you to be skeptical because, you know, you're going to hear in the news, as you've heard before, that these animal studies are telling you that if you want to live longer, You've got to exercise more, you've got to lift weights, and you've got to starve, right? But look what you're dealing with. Look where you're getting the data from. I mean, these animals are not doing anything, and they get ad libitum food. They can eat as much as they want all the time. So they don't represent you. And second, even if I say that cages are the problem, you know, don't take my word for it. Make your own decisions. Do your own reading. But if at some point along the way what I'm saying resonates with you, speak up. Because it's not only the well-being of those animals. It's your tax dollars, and it could be your health. Thanks.